welcome to NAPOD, where we provide NA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us to be self-supporting by visiting NAPOD.xyz. Look for the donate link and drop a dollar or two in the virtual basket. If you're also an AA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Sobercast. Sobercast features AA speakers and workshops in the same format as NAPOD. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Sobercast, that's two words, on any podcast player app or go to Sobercast.com. Enjoy the podcast, and thanks for listening. Welcome to the over a quarter of a century clean and loving it workshop here in WCNA 31. My name is Bob and I'm the uh, Can we please open the meeting with the syringe prayer? After a moment of silence. God. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I'll probably introduce the people here on, on the podium. The meeting in the excitement of recovery and staying clean over 25 years in the process. If I look out over the crowd here, we have many people over here in, that has over 25 years, which is a, a testament within itself to this thing called uh, recovery works. On the stage here, we have many people that's going to tell you part of their experience and adventure of recovery in their, I would say, the first 25 years, because many of them are on the second part of the 25 years of another. <clears throat> portion of their life. Um, part of it we winged it here and part of it is that there was no rehearsal in terms of what we're going to say and how we're going to say it. So if we seem to uh, uh, bobble or, you know, uh, flub the, the catch of the ball, whatever the case may be, uh, cheers on anyhow because we haven't dropped the ball yet. <laughs> so we're going to start off with the first speaker here, all the way from Pennsylvania. We're going to introduce Denny. You're on. Uh, I'm Denny, and I'm an addict. I sit over here because I thought they'd start over there. <laughs> I'm just humbled that uh, I'm just grateful that. Um, the God of my understanding um, has blessed me with friends and, and um, just fellowship. Oh, him. And when Michael called me and asked me to speak and, and told me what the topic was and what we were going to be doing, I was like, Michael, I can't do that. He says, relax. It'll be just, a, I don't have just about four or five of you and 2,000 of your friends. <laughs> I'm just really grateful. Um, you know, I, I remember that first day like it was yesterday. Yeah. You know, I was lost. I was scared. Um, I remember walking off the elevator at Friday night hospital at Divine Providence in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And the door opened up, and there was a guy there named Tom L. And introduced himself. said, hi, I'm Tom, and I'm an addict. This? And I said, I'm Denny, and I guess I am too. And um, I didn't know what I was. I knew I was crazy. I knew I abused everybody and everything I've ever done in my life. And uh, I was just scared. 
But something happened that day. Uh, the first time in my life that I finally felt a part of something. And it was people like you that, that made me feel that way. I, um, I just knew that I, that I found a home. I didn't have to be anything other than myself. Because my whole life I was a chameleon. I wanted to, to be with the, with the hippies. And back those days we were called hippies. <laughs> and uh, if you can imagine, well, I have hair today too, but it's not all mine. <laughs> but uh, I had real long hair and uh, I had a beard. I, I looked like Charles Manson and I thought I was, I thought I was it. <laughs> It was kind of different. The area that I got clean in was kind of, it was a lot of influence from a local rehab. And um, at the time, we had urine surveillance. <laughs> and if you weren't on urine surveillance, nobody hung out with you. It was quite a bit different. And that was not, not a constant anonymous program. That was just what happened in our local area. Every Tuesday and Thursday, we'd go up to this rehab and pee in a bottle. And pay him $7. And in 1976, $7 is a lot, a lot of money. And God forbid you relapse, because back then, if you relapsed, they, nobody would talk to you. They didn't clap when you come back in the rooms. And if you, you know, they, were, they, just, they just shunned you. I don't think that's right, but that's what we did. You know, we were scared, but we had a fellowship. We hung out day and night. We hung out with each other and we just spent all the time we could with each other. If we weren't at a meeting, we were at somebody's house playing cards or just being together. And, um, a couple of things that really stand out in my early recovery is, are the, the relationships. And I was blessed to, to meet a woman in, um, in, in my active addiction, God bless her, who who saw something in me that she had some hope and it was my wife Luann and she was a big and still is a big part of my recovery supported me and opened our, our doors <clears throat> see because back then we we just didn't send people off to rehab we took them into our house and detoxed them on our couches and and um she was this naive young girl from the country, and I introduced her to all these crazy people. And she taught me how to how to love and how to take care of other people. And this fellowship taught me that. We do some crazy things. You know, we we do some things in the the name of recovery. And one thing that stands out in my mind was these guys. Uh, God bless them all had this infinite wisdom about starting this group for five years and over. <laughs> you had to have five years of recovery and over to, in order to attend the meeting. At the time, I had eight years. And I remember they called me on the phone and said, uh, Hey, Denny, we want you to get involved with this group we, we, we started up. It's really going good. It's, it's called the five-year and over group. You had to have five years to... to to attend. I said, man, that's the greatest thing I've heard since I got clean. I said, and this guy had, I think, about six years. I said, I think we need to change it, though, to eight years and over. <laughs> and he said, um, well, why is that? I said, so you can't go. But we do a lot of crazy things in the, in, in the name of recovery. Um, I'm, I'm not a big person on special interest groups, and that's just me. And because my experience with stuff like that, see, because when I walked in that door for the first time, I didn't have to be anything but me. I didn't have to be smart, even though I am. I, uh, <laughs> I didn't have to be good looking, even though I am. <laughs> All I had to be was an addict. No other requirements. See, because if there had been any other requirements, I wouldn't be here. So I tried the, you know, all the other ways and, of staying clean. And um, for me, it just didn't work. 
this fellowship opened its arms to me. You know, I have um, a few people on Guido A and Dick B and Bob B and some guys that were intimate and important parts of my early recovery. And um, I'm just so grateful for this fellowship. It works. And to think I've been here since 1976, I just blows me away. I just am so um, overwhelmed. Um, I just thank God for another day of recovery. I just want you to know that I still go to meetings. I still sponsor people. Um, real quick, I want to share a story. You know, I often pray for God to put people in my life. And about a year and a half ago, um, I was praying one morning for God to expand my territories and to bring somebody in my life. And I'm driving into work and I never pick up hitchhikers anymore. I used to, but not anymore. And uh, I'm driving down the, the road and there's this guy hitchhiking and I just pull over. <clears throat> and the guy gets in my car and I'm asking where he's going. He said, he said he's going into town. And I said, do you hitchhike? Very much. He said, no, it's the first day. He said, I lost my license for DUI. Which he kind of lied. He <laughs> said, oh yeah. I said, do they make you go to their meetings? He said, yeah, I've been to about four or five of them. I said, well, I'm Denny S. And um, I'm, I'm a recovering addict. And he looked at me so bewildered. He says, you know, I just got out of prison a couple of days ago. And my cellmate told me that when I got out of jail, that if I looked up Denny S., he would help me stay clean. You know, <laughs> my God, my higher power is so powerful and beyond my, my comprehensive. And I know this fellowship works. And I know for me, it's a, my recovery is an unwarranted gift. And I just have to carry it on and continue to, to share what's been fully given to me. And I'm just so grateful. And that's all I got. We're not perfect yet. We got some house, <laughs> little housekeeping here, uh, uh, getting things in, in its order. Uh, we get better as we go along. You know, we've done a lot of practice here. Uh, these are some readings that we need to take care of before we get into trouble. <laughs> you laugh now. Laughter <laughs> Ron Z. Here he comes. Bob, does he have to start over again? And he's an addict. <laughs> My name's Ron Z. I'm an addict from Northern California, Shasta County. Why are we here? Before coming to the fellowship of NA, we cannot manage our own lives. We cannot live and enjoy life as other people do. We had to have something different. We thought we had found it in drugs. We placed their use ahead of our welfare, our families, our wives, husbands, and our children. We had to have drugs at all costs. We did many people great harm, but most of all, we harmed ourselves. Through our inability to accept personal responsibility, we were actually creating our own problems. We seem to be incapable of facing life on its own terms. Most of us realized that in our addiction we were slowly committing suicide. But addiction is such a cunning enemy of life that we had lost the power to do anything about it. Many of us ended up in jail or sought help through medicine, religion, and psychiatry. None of these methods were sufficient for us. Our disease always resurfaced and continued to progress until in desperation we sought help from each other in Narcotics Anonymous. After coming to N.A., we realized we were sick people. We had suffered from a disease from which there is no known cure. It can, however, be arrested at some point, and recovery is then possible. 
Thank you. Now we'll read, as I said, we're still out of order, but um, Paula, uh, Claudia P. from Portland, well, tell us what the NA program is. I'm an addict. My name is Claudia P. Hi, Claudia. My home group is Early Riser from the Miracles Club in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> what is the Narcotics Anonymous program? NA is a nonprofit fellowship or society of men and women for whom drugs have become a major problem. We are recovering addicts who meet regularly to help each other stay clean. This is a program of complete abstinence from all drugs. There is only one requirement for membership, the desire to stop using. We suggest that you keep an open mind and give yourself a break. Our program is a set of principles written so simple that you can follow them in our daily lives. The most important thing about them is that they work. There are no strings attached to NA. We are not affiliated with any other organizations. We have no initiation fees or dues. No pledges to sign, no promises to make to anyone. We are not connected with any political, religious, or law enforcement groups. We are under no surveillance at any time. Anyone may join us regardless of age, race, sexual identity, creed, religion, or lack of religion. We are not interested in what or how much you used or who your connections were, what you have done in the past, how much or how little you have, but only in what you want to do about your problem and how we can help. The newcomer is the most important person at any meeting because we can only keep what we have by giving it away. We have learned from our group experience that those who keep coming to our meetings regularly stay clean. And a bit more housekeeping. Um, all the cell phones and pagers and all those things, uh, tell them uh, put it on hold or uh, take my calls and I'll take them after the meeting. Please. Our next uh, presenter or speaker here is someone I've known a long time. In fact, is, uh, I think we share the same hometown, you know, in some far off place. Uh, we almost forgot her this morning. We left her in a lurch somewhere. We, but well, we've taken care of business, and uh, the person is Leah, the new Leah. The song, baby. Okay, I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Almost forgot me again. It's Mike. Um, hi, everybody. I'm an addict. I'm grateful to be clean today. I'm a grateful and proud member of Narcotics Anonymous. I'm from Miami, Florida. My name is Liam. I didn't know I was going to work this weekend. I thought I was skating. Yeah, you can't hear me? See, Jack, I told you, it's real different. I feel like a Verizon guy. Can you hear me now? Okay. You don't ever want to give me a podium. Are you crazy? At the, at the 12 coconuts the other night, they took, McDermott told me, God, you need to share. You haven't shared all weekend. I said, but I can't do three minutes. He said, just do it. They had to tell me, time's up. I knew that. Okay. I got clean survival group. Uh... 
My, the date of my last drug was June the 23rd, 1980. I hope that was my last drug. I just celebrated my 25th anniversary. And I say that with total amazement because my family had me pegged for dead at 25. When I celebrated my 50th birthday, my cousin said to me, are you depressed because you're 50? I said, no, frankly, I'm amazed. And she said, well, that's good because the family had you pegged for dead at 25. So I'm on borrowed time for sure. Um, I got clean and survival group in Miami, Florida. And I was the sixth, the sixth member in that group. And when they sent me away for long-term treatment, I had already been to several, meet, several meetings there out of a detox in South Miami. And I was afraid to go away for long-term treatment because I was afraid that Narcotics Anonymous wasn't going to be there when I got back. You see, I found a home here. My first, very first meeting, I found a home here. And I've never looked back. Because th this was the first place that ever said, keep coming back. Every other place always used to say, get them around here. You're nothing but trouble. <laughs> Even my house, my family's home. <laughs> you know, um, they locked the doors on me at the age of 19. My mother didn't, but... She had to, because of my father, and she used to sneak me stuff out the back door. I always had a care package waiting out the back door. Some clothes, some food, and at the bottom of the bag was always part of her social security check. Um, Narcotics Anonymous in, in South Miami was really small. It was small in North Miami, and the, the oldest group in that area was in West Palm Beach. That was the mainliners group. And there was a group in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and then there was us. And then New Connection started in North Miami at the same time at this old, old clubhouse, the back room club. And I'll tell you something. The first time when I came back from treatment, it was okay because we were still there. And I took to this program like a drowning man takes to a life preserver, if he's smart enough to take to a life preserver. Because there's a story about the life preserver, the guy's drowning in the lake, and asks God to help him, and a boat comes by, and the man in the boat says, come on, jump in, I'll help you. And he says, no, 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 God's going to help me. And he's, and he's going down for the second time, and another boat comes by, and the man says, come on, jump in the boat, I'll help you. And the guy says, no, 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 it's cool, God's going to help me. And he's drowning. And he asks God, come on, you've you got to help me. I'm drowning here. And he goes down. Uh, got, a boat comes by. And the guy says, come on, jump on the boat. I'll help you. And he says, no, no, God's going to help me. And he's going down and he's drowning. And he says, God, why'd you abandon me? He says, you dumb fuck. I sent you three boats. You know, so it's one of, one of those kind of things. But I, I grabbed down to the first boat. And... um I'll tell you something. The sewer that I crawled out of, I had nowhere else to go. Um, I started trying to get clean 10 years before I got clean. And uh, this, this, this program gave me a choice. They told me to check my misery at the door, come in, sit down, take the, take the cotton out of my ears and shove it in my mouth and shut up, sit down and listen. And I said, okay. And after I started to get clean, I took the cotton out of my mouth, and I haven't stopped yet. <laughs> but um, the, the message of hope that I got here, I looked for you people my whole life. Um, never in my life did I ever have a choice. The drugs made the choice. And after the drugs made the choice, well, first, my parents made the choice. Then the teachers made the choice. Then the drugs made the choice. Then the police made the choice. And then the judge made the choice. And then the PO made the choice. 
and on and on and on and on. I never made the choice. Narcotics Anonymous allowed me to make the choice. And I make that choice on a daily basis. And so far, all of this time, I've continued to make that choice on a daily basis. And I'll tell you something. This ride, I remember Dutch telling me when I was really new, fasten your seatbelt, kid, you're in for the ride of your life. And a truer statement has never been told to me like that. It was always, you better, you have to do your water, you must, and all that. And you know something? There are some things that I must do to stay here. There's no doubt about that. If I want to stay clean, there are certain things that I must do. And when I tell the girls that I sponsor, you must, I don't want to hear any shit. I don't play that. If you want what I have, then you've got to do what I did. And if you don't like it, take it on the hike. Go find another sponsor, because I don't have the patience today. I'm fucking old. I'm old. And I'm not here to argue with anybody. I'll go to hell to help you if you want the help. If you don't want the help, you can go to hell alone, because I was there. It was an awful movie. And I'm not really open to the sequel. Sequels are never the same anyway. The first movie is always the best. So, and they get mad at me. And the kids in the meetings today, when I, when I start spouting my shit, they say, we don't do it that way anymore. Well, you know what? The disease hasn't changed. The disease hasn't changed. So I tell them, you know something? And they say, well, you, you say don't get involved in a relationship for a year. No major decisions for a year. That's not written down anywhere. Well, if you're on the literature committee, are you listening? Write it down. Because when I tell them that, they tell me, oh, you're full of shit. You know what? And you know what? I, when I left treatment, they told me to take my self-respect, move it from my crotch to my heart, and I'll be okay. I lasted 11 months. If you can last 11 months without getting laid, if I can do it, you can do it. Nobody ever died from no sex, and I thought I was going to be the first one. I was close. But I made it. And I won't tell anybody to do something that I won't do. So I'm not going to tell you a year. I'll tell you 11 months. So with that, I will say to you this, because five minutes is five minutes, and I'm not going to say five minutes and go on for a half an hour. But the truth of the matter is, is that I've never lost the love affair I've had for this program. And thank God this program has never lost its love affair for me, because if you kick me to the curb, I'm totally fucked. I stay here because I want to stay here. I stay here th because I need to stay here. Anybody that knows me knows that. But the beauty is I stay here because I want to stay here. And if I, can't, if I can't give it away, then I don't know what I'll do with the rest of my life. So please, if you're here, stay here. If you're new, stay here. If you're old, stay here. Because without you, I can't. Thanks. Our next speaker is Stu, Southern California. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, it's better. I can beat on it longer, and I'm willing. Yeah. Hi, my name's Stu. I'm an addict. Uh, I'm not going to beat on the mic as much as Leah. Uh, I, uh... I love staying clean. I, uh, you know, I was I was thinking when I, sitting up here when I got when I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I and I was new. I I, I would sit there and go, I wonder what it's going to be like when I after I have 25 years, and then what would it be like after I have 30 years? Uh, and it wasn't. <laughs> it. I have to say that you know a lot of what. I anticipated this to became true, but for the most part, it had really came about in a way different way. 
Um, I came to Narcotics Anonymous when, when uh, via an institution and uh, through a recovery house. I think that, you know, they brought me to meetings and I sat there and listened to people talk and um, I had been in several other programs, people trying to help me, help me and stuff, and I did, uh, I did terrible. I usually got everybody loaded and I got loaded. I, I never did very well in treatment up to then. And, uh, but, you know, sitting in, in, in uh, I know my early meetings in, in my first five or six days, you know, the message of Narcotics Anonymous was carried to me and uh, I came to believe. Um, I, it, it took a short time for me to um, understand that, you know, uh, how it worked and all that. And, and, you know, pretty much, I think pretty much anybody could read the books and stuff and, and you can figure out how this works. I think the, the thing that got me is that, that um, I had a sponsor who uh, really believed in in in, in, in that the program was, was, was based in the heart. And, uh, you know, I, I was the kind of guy who was very selfish and very self-centered, didn't really care too much about other people. And I, and I was scared most of the time. But the bottom line was is that he, I, I, learned, I learned that Narcotics Anonymous was, was a thing about the heart and not about what I knew. Um, you know, and I... I uh, I never look back, you know, and I, I, I have not really been blessed with a real smooth recovery. I've, I've done a lot of things in Narcotics Anonymous. I've been married a couple times. I've had um, a couple families. I've got three kids. All three of my kids are addicts. Um, you know, I kind of took that personal for a while. And, uh, but who else better to have to raise addicts? And I... I uh, Shit, I don't know. You know, I, I uh, all, all of my kids, except for one still working on a story, is in recovery. I, I, uh, I have, kind of like Leah, I, I live Narcotics Anonymous. Narcotics Anonymous is my life, has been my life for many, many years, and I, I, uh, I uh, really don't really know another life than Narcotics Anonymous. I grew up here. Um, you know, I was born and raised in California, and then I, I did... I, I did my using in Venice, and I got clean in Venice. Eventually, uh, you know, uh, uh, so I still live there today. I live in Simi Valley. Um, it's where I go to meetings and where I participate in my recovery. You know, and I, I sometimes, you know, I look I, you know, I read some of the things, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I don't really have a problem staying clean. I... I you know, I have things that go on in my life that are kind of hairy sometimes. That you know, I, and a lot of times I feel that my life could be a lot better. Uh, and sometimes I believe that I screw it up. And and uh, but you know, I I I work this program in my life. I work the steps. I carry the message. I do what it is that it is to be a member of Narcotics Anonymous, and I believe in this program. Um, you know, and. and I feel really blessed to have a lot of people, a lot of friends that I know also believe in this program. And, uh, you know, from when I walked in the doors of Narcotics Anonymous, I'm completely a different person. And so is the people that I got clean with. So are the people that I've had the, the honor to participate in their recovery. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a beautiful thing, man, when, when you know, the people sitting next to you, you, you it, it, you become honored, man, to just to participate in other people's lives. I mean, when I got here, the thought of me participating in somebody else's life was huge, man. It was not a good thing, you know. Today, man, I, you know, I have friends that, you know, uh, they love me no matter what. And, you know, they've had to, <laughs> you know. And uh, I know my friends are there for me, and, and I'm there for them. And that's the thing that's something that was never mine. So when I was new and I was wondering what it would be like to be over 25 years clean and all that, you know, uh, the peace, the freedom, and to belong to something was the three things that I kind of wanted the most. And, uh, 
And I've gotten every one of them tenfold, and, and uh, you know, I truly believe. And I, and I hope that if you're new or you're old or uh, you're thinking about hanging around, uh, that you come to believe, man, this is a beautiful thing, and, and, and I just hope you get whatever I got. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Oregon. My name is Harry. I'm Harry, and I'm an addict. And I, I got clean June 7, 1972, and I've been clean ever since. And I faxed my addiction, and I got clean in the Great Northwest in the city of Portland, Oregon. And in, 1970, in 1972, um, I come in to the end of my road of addiction, and uh, it was time for me to go to prison. And God, for selling drugs and criminality, and God in His infinite mercy decided to send me to a treatment program. And that's why I attended my first Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And while in that treatment program, uh, the first week I was there, my brother, who's 27, I was 29, my brother was 27, he committed suicide. So things for me uh, got worse before they got better. And, you know, sometimes they say God takes uh, one to save two. And I really believe that that's what happened. Uh, when he took him, playtime for me was over. You know, I, I, in that program, I identified drugs uh, through the in a literature and to the people as my enemy and it killed my brother and it killed a lot of my friends and it's going to kill me too if I didn't you know get about the business of get my life in order I really didn't like myself well enough to go through what I needed to go through in order to stay clean there was only two of us you know my brother and myself so when my brother committed suicide my mother only had me so it was my uh, responsibility to go home and try to uh, be there for her and, um, you know, the first few years I was clean, I, you know, I never really believed I could stay clean. I hoped I could. And I figured that I was just going to, you know, do what I could do, start walking in, in, in the direction of recovery and see how far I could get. And, uh, you know, I'm still walking. I think, you know, I got so many, many wonderful things from this program, but the most important thing I got is my life. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, everybody else uh, that says in our literature, not only is this a better way of life that I have now, it's better than any life I've ever known, because I was miserable, suicidal, uh, had been in and out of mental hospitals, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, homeless, you know, never really had any deep, fulfilling relationship with the opposite sex, because drugs always sabotaged it, been thrown out of the military, all kind of stuff that happened to me. And, you know, my active addiction was 14 years, and uh, I've been clean 33. So, I, you know, the program gave me many, many things, and I think uh, the first trust that meeting I went to was Narcotics Anonymous, and the first great thing it gave me was access to a God of my own understanding. Also, it gave me a fellowship, uh, and which I didn't really understand and appreciate for years because we were kind of small when we started in Portland. There was only a couple of meetings, and it took like until I went to the World Convention in 1978 that we began to meet, meet Bob and, and, and Gene H. And, and uh, Bob B, Bob Bird from San Francisco, those kind of people, those, to me, the good old timers, the ones, they opened the, the gates for us for Narcotics Anonymous as a worldwide fellowship and stopped being just, you know, us in Portland struggling along with the help of the 12 step, with the other 12 step program. So, uh, you know, it's been my, my, my pleasure, like it says, and uh, I knew it you also, uh, my pleasure and my purpose to carry this message ever since I came out of treatment. Because uh, I needed more than just a way to stay clean. I needed a way of life. You know, I needed a fellowship. You know, I needed a community of people to be a part of, to give my life meaning and purpose. And I've gotten all that here. 
You know, I've got more than I ever hoped for. Yeah, I, was, I was talking to one of my friends the other day. I never dreamed of going to Hawaii. Not when I was using it and not when I was playing it. You know? I couldn't dream that big. You know, I always had to have other people come along and say, let's do this. And I said, oh, wow, that sounds great. When I was using drugs, I couldn't get out of Portland. It was North Portland, Southwest Portland. That's as far as I could go. So, uh, you know, Narcotics Anonymous took me places where, I, you know, it's just absolutely wonderful. Being here is wonderful. And, uh, you know, I'm just so, so grateful for this program. And, and you know, I, you know, for me anyway, my, you know, I enjoy being clean more today than I ever have. I have more peace. I have more joy. I feel closer to higher power. I have more things. You know, uh, recovery is a blessing. Thank you. Thank you for Harry. Uh, our next speaker is Tony from Texas. Thank you. My name is Tony, and I'm an addict. I got it. And by the grace of God and you people in this program, Narcotics Anonymous, I've been clean since July 17th, 1973. And for that, I am so grateful. I, I, I hear the other speakers, and, you know, they just share my story. They just tell my, you know, my tale. So um, that's why I love to come to the World Conventions, so that I can hear uh, other people that have had my experience. Uh, I got clean in Houston, Texas, and uh, there was a group of us that went to uh, another program that uh, were all addicts, and we all hung together. And uh, one of the, the ladies and one of the women and, and the, a man uh, got a pamphlet from Dallas or somewhere. I always forget the details. Uh, but they got a little N.A. pamphlet and, uh, from Sister Amelia, actually, at the St. Joseph Hospital. And uh, we started, uh, about 15 or 20 of us started uh, an N.A. meeting in Houston, Texas. And I'm going to tell you something. When I walked in the doors of the other fellowship, I used to just, you know, I got a joy there. I got a joy there. And um, and I was in an ex-offender program. I was the first woman through, you know, I was so messed up, y'all, that, um, I mean, I'm serious. I, 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 no one has really told my story since I've been here. Uh Except maybe one or two, you know, I've heard bits and pieces, but uh, I was a dope king for 17 years, and I shot heroin, and, and I, you know, I just went the whole gamut. Been to penitentiary three times, and uh, two times, but I did three threes. And, uh, you know, I, I come out of the penitentiary, and I really wanted to do this thing, but, and there was a five-time ex-convict that came to the program in the penitentiary. And his wife, and Alan, and they're the ones that brought me in. They're deceased now, Sonny and Samuel Wells. They brought me into the other fellowship and through their halfway house. And so they made a place for me because I had to go to an AA center. They wouldn't even let me um, be a client because I wasn't a drunk. Uh, they, they, they let me be custodian so I could clean the house and make the meetings, you know. And so... The reason that I'm so grateful for Narcotics Anonymous is because I said, God, if there's a way, you know, bring me some of my people so that I can, I need your help, you know. And it was, um, it was not very long. It was just a few days after that. I went to, 30 days, I, I stayed in the detox for like 51 and I went out and I want you to know this little group of people that I hooked up with, we all hung together. And uh, we hung together. If one of them would slip, we would go get them. And we hung together. And uh, some of my best friends today uh, are here, and uh, uh, that we were in that group together. You know? And they're still clean. And that group was called, we named it Alive and Kicking. 
And uh, I was so proud of that. <laughs> you know, I thought, alive and kicking. Well, I was dead when I got here. And uh, so that little group, well, you know how addicts are. We, they really got, <laughs> really got in their stuff. And they, you know, we had a couple that came through the, because they had a detox there. Um, and, and especially heroin addicts, we just had to really, we were just know-it-alls, you know. So they just didn't think that us ogre members should be there, so they kicked us out. And they had it by invitation only. So we went and started another group. And um, we started two groups, actually, right back to back, the natural high group and the hair group. And, um, and then I opened a, 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 a treatment facility. I had a year and four months. When I had 30 days, God told me that we, that, that was going to come about. And when we had this deep, this little, this little dinky place, honey, I, you know, New Directions had gotten a, a half million dollars. You know, in those days, that half million dollars was a lot of bucks, right? Well, I just knew God, was, he told me to do this, right? He was really going to give me, bless me, and let me have, you know, a nice place. But that's not the way it was. I got a, a, a trick house. Uh, that the horse walked up and down the street and they turned, had a mattress in there and they turned the tricks in the, in, in the sounds. So I got it for six months and I re, we redid it. NA people redid it. And we had, um, we moved those two, after we got it redone, we moved those two groups to, um, to that house so that they would have a place to meet. And uh, a lot of Houston people got clean, <laughs> just like those girls, that little nine-bed detox did. They, they got clean in, that, uh, in those meetings. But Narcotics Anonymous has been the, uh, the process that, we, that all of, I mean, it wasn't like treatment like you see it today. Although we were, the out, we were really outstanding. We really got a lot of notoriety, and notoriety because we were the first ones there that ever treated addicts. Addicts could come in as long as they didn't want to be on medication. God, God, I was scared to death of medication. <laughs> uh, and uh, but Narcotics Anonymous taught all of us, and we had like 50 people in that little. We had a living room, and 50 people that to 60s, 70s, according to how many people would begin treatment to that would come. Um, that uh, we recovered. We recovered together. I, I, you know, I, I, was a, I was a lot of first because I had the most clean time. I was a lot of first. Um, I was the um, first, well, first I went was the first woman through the New Directions. That, that took a trip. And uh, they kicked me out in the middle of the night because I wasn't doing what they thought I should be doing because I was at a meeting. Um, because there's a 10.30 meeting at night there, and I always went to that 10.30 meeting. And because I went and didn't get back till 11.30, well, I got kicked out in the middle of the night. But the things that – but N.A. people come and showed up, and they picked me up, you know. And uh, I could stay on people's couches. And every three months I would get – in uh, three to six months, my mother was a periodic alcoholic. And as I took my first four step, I found that my, my patterns were, were right there, you know, with her drinking. And uh, I'd get kicked out, change jobs, change places, change houses, change men, change whatever, you know. And, uh, but Narcotics Anonymous has always been there in my recovery. I mean, they had the people. You know, I know that the program is the base of our recovery. But the people had to bring me the program. I was so um, immature. I always say sick, but you know what sick means to me is immature. I was so immature. And they just took me like a little kid and helped me grow up in this fellowship. And they taught me, because they could love me, I could, I began to love, love back. Love. I mean, I just don't know if y'all know how important love is. But it's the one ingredient that I, were, I was lacking in and that I have so much of today because of you. Every group that I had belonged to, I'm, I'm a member, and I want to say this before I sit down, I'm a member of the Brazos Valley area uh, of, uh, of Narcotics Anonymous in uh, Bryan, Texas. And it's the most blessing that I've ever had. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> Moving from my home group where I, you know, somebody knew me and knew who I was, you know, 
much. You know, and you go to a little small town that still does it the AA way, and I'm in it, honey, and I tell you, I just thump my foot and declare, you know, I have to really watch my mouth. Um, and, you know, because they, they hear a lot saying that's not the way we do it here. But five years I've been there, and I want you to know that our area is it's so strong. It's not big. But it's so strong in the fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. It is, they learn. We do tradition workshops. We do concepts. We do, you know, it's so wonderful to, to be able. And I tell people this because with time, you run through so many things that, uh, in Narcotics Anonymous that you just want to run. You don't want to stay. You know. But I stayed. I stayed. And I'm the one that benefits from this, y'all. But I believe that we carry, we, if you know something or you are, you believe something about Narcotics Anonymous and they're not doing the way that you think it should be done. But you know, I think that we have to stand for what we believe. And I stand for Narcotics Anonymous. And today I can tell you that my area and my home group called Miracles Happen of Bryan, Texas, they do it the Narcotics Anonymous way because I say. <laughs> We're not the only ones who recover in this world. So down under. <laughs> so down under. We have God. <laughs> I'm Scott from an addict. I've only ever had the privilege of uh, sharing at a dinosaur's meeting down under. I think we started 20 years down there. I, um, this is interesting for me. I'm going through a weird, weird stage in my recovery. Um, I'm relaxed. <laughs> Actually, last night I, had a, I jumped out of my sleep. I was dreaming about this meeting this morning. And I, I freaked out because I, I dozed off while I was sharing. And I used to look at the old guys in the meetings, you know, dozing off at meetings back home, and uh, I don't know why it happened. I just I thought, I'm feeling really relaxed, and what a horrible thing to do to fall asleep while you're sharing. But, um, I came, uh, I, I actually started uh, attending meetings of Narcotics Anonymous, I think it was around about 72, 1972, 1974. And I went to my first meeting of uh, Narcotics Anonymous. And um, it was actually uh, in a health department building and they had the uh, steps up on the wall and they had funded by the health department <laughs> and um, everybody there was having the odd scratch and the odd, you know, itchy nose. Um, I, I copped at that meeting and I uh, thought, I'm coming back. <laughs> And if you're interested, you can go into the, uh, I saw it yesterday in the uh, literature dis dis display, of the historical display down in one of the rooms downstairs. It's actually, I didn't realise they had it. It's one of the first, um, we, we know it as the little white book or the white book. Uh, down there was the black book, because everybody, everybody wore black back in those days. And when you have a look in there, every second page has an advertisement on it, like uh, Woodcoffle Funeral Parlour or... Dan's Butchers or um, um, why I'm mentioning this is that um, I mean that was the Narcotics Anonymous I came into um, no one had any idea what was going on you know they, they got all this advertising so they could reprint the white book and um, you know I came back to a few meetings I scored a few more times or copped a few more times and um, um, uh, ended up on methadone and went out and researched for a little bit longer well, I eventually uh, started coming back to meetings around about the, I guess, the late 70s. We were, we, I was doing Drugs Anonymous and that was basically AA literature with the word alcohol crossed out and drugs put over it with highlighter. 
And, um, you know, but I did notice that they had the traditions there and uh, with the traditions there I started seeing uh, what was wrong with the Narcotics Anonymous I went to previously. And why I mention this, I guess uh, uh, much later when I actually uh, finally got clean in 79 um, uh, and we started, uh, well actually started Narcotics Anonymous as we know it down under these days, uh, how how we held on to the the traditions with vigilance because... um, how we have to protect the meetings from uh, that kind of thing going on because uh, very new, very early days, um, I actually found the literature in rehab. You know, I was in treatment, I found the narcotics and the, the literature in rehab. We carried that around and photocopied it and did everything with it. And, uh, and a couple of years later, um, we found out you guys existed. <laughs> we thought it was ours. <laughs> I remember coming to my first World Service Conference in 1986 and I had the pamphlet, we made a decision. They said, oh, you can't have that, it's been out of circulation, we haven't used that for years. I went, oh, okay, and you can't, you can't photocopy that literature, you shouldn't be doing that because, you know, we've got to keep the movement happening, we've got to keep generating more, more literature. And, you know, recovery, even at a service level, was very, very... Um, uh, by experience, you know, we didn't have a lot of mentoring going on in the early days. But, you know, my recovery over the 20, you know, I've been clean 26 years, and uh, <laughs> why I say I'm in a new stage of my recovery, it's experimental again, because uh, 26 of that 24 years I've been at the front of. Uh, some kind of service work. In the early days, the only reason we had literature because we were out there sort of photocopying and putting it out on tables. The only reason we had... Uh, um, it was the same people doing the same things all the time until the meeting started to grow. We actually started going to the other fellowship and recruiting the addicts out of that fellowship into ours. <laughs> we had this saying that if... Um, uh, the only way NA was going to grow is if you had a meeting every day. So uh, we were very, very big on getting people out of... Uh, the other fellowship who were actually addicts but uh, didn't know that NA was happening into ours so we could build our fellowship for ourselves in the future. Over this time, um, you know, like I, I've been fortunate enough to sort of do, uh, you know, obviously group level service but uh, area service, regional service. I, as I said, I came here as the uh, alternate RSR for Australia and New Zealand because New Zealand was one of our areas. As an RSR in those days, that was real fun. I mean, I'd be flying, you know, five hours to Perth for an ASC, then flying four hours to the left to New Zealand for an ASC. It was, uh, you know, not not a lot of people realise that Australia is the same size as the US. You know, it's a big geographic uh, area to cover. And, um, you know, in those days people didn't get funded to go anywhere. They caught a bus from Adelaide or caught a bus from from Brisbane, you know, like 14-hour bus trips to get to the regional meeting. But, you know, like uh, everything in those days, I I feel... uh, I was extremely fortunate and privileged to be able to serve because it was fun. You know, all those tough times were fun. We actually, you know, we realised after a while that uh, principles came out of a lot of arguments over with personalities. You know, we finally argued and argued, and we all, real, all of a sudden we realised we're arguing for the same thing. Who, who, we all wanted our own way, but the, the bottom line is we wanted the best for Narcotics Anonymous. You know, so I mean. This, this was, this was uh, great, you know, and I finally got introduced to, to World Services and this is where um, I think uh, I was very fortunate again to have uh, people, you know, like I'm one of the, the younger dinosaurs at this meeting, but um, it, was, uh, it was very, very uh, eye-opening for me to see other people because at home I, I was an older member, you know. Um, here I started finding people who had a lot more clean time and, you know, one thing I want to say here, we, we talk a lot about clean time, but I tell you what, I personally think clean time is nice to have, but, it, you know, it's not going to keep you clean, you know, it's, uh, you, you've got to do some work. <laughs> one of the things, you know, I've had, I mean, like, my, rec- my 25 years, 26 years of recovery has been, uh, uh, you know, like on a roller coaster. You know, I, uh, I'd work the steps really hard. I'd do lots of meetings. I'd be, you know, working a serious program, and then I'd get for a big serious growth movement, and and then I'd feel like I could sort of cruise because um, 
Um, you know, I was doing it. You hear it a lot. I was doing it to subconsciously. You know, and I've heard also, you know, like uh, after a while you could you do a lot of things subconsciously. It's almost like doing it on autopilot. You know, but sometimes I've noticed, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work out most of the time these days where I'm relaxed or complacent because uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm actually in control of the automatic pilot sometimes because, uh, and this is why I need the fellowship. I need people around me all the time. I need people to sort of keep me in check. This, is, this, 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 uh, this, this convention has been incredible for me because it's the first convention I've been to for a long, long time which I haven't had a service position to do something. You know, I've always had to get up at a certain time and be over this room or be down here for registration, be up there to set a room up. It's been very, very strange for me to be at a convention where I can just wake up when I want to wake up, go to the meeting, whatever meeting I want to go to, you know, go to bed early, go, go shopping if I want to. It's been really interesting for me. So I think it's, I guess it's the fruits of recovery. I don't know, but it's what it feels like. When I saw the topic... Um, I was very interested because I said this is the last two years of my recovery has been a bit different from the first 24 where um, after finishing and I didn't realise it because I, I just finished up doing uh, World Services uh, service for uh, the last conference so you know someone said you know well you've been here 18 years I thought what? 18 years? Like I came in as an RSR uh, well, you know here halfway down the back earrings all over me with a seven year old son which I was a single parent and uh, you know I've got three grandchildren now um, I married the RD or RSR from the UK region which really pissed them off um, but she came home as our PI chair straight away I mean service is service and um, just wasn't over there and I thought I was getting away with a dirty weekend in Mexico to tell you the truth it didn't happen that way never stopped um, but the last couple of years has been really interesting because um, you know this didn't happen at an uh, NA event but I was with a lot of NA people we went to a Rolling Stones concert and I just finished this service as I said for 18 years and uh, you know I actually at some stages I, I just think that maybe it became a secondary addiction because it became my life full stop, you know, and I wasn't doing too much with work and relationships and family and all that sort of thing. And I don't, and I mean, I've had other things, secondary addictions, that do the same thing. And this work, 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 I can be a workaholic where that will do the same thing. But I was at a Rolling Stones concert and I was watching uh, the guys do their thing, you know, I was lucky to be down the front row. And, um, our Prime Minister is about 60, 64 or 65 years of age and he looks it, you know. And uh, I'm seeing Jagger and Keith Richards do all those things. I thought, that bastard, you know, he looks like he's, he's, he looks like he's worn out two bodies, he looks so old. But, and, and the thing is that he, he was doing yoga positions with that guitar on stage so I didn't need help getting up off the ground if I bent down that far, you know. And I thought, well, what, what is it, what is it, you know. And I thought, well, hang on, they're doing something they love doing. And I started looking at the clock. I thought, hang on, the clock's ticking. You know, I'm 53 now. I was 52 then. And I thought, I know what, uh, you know, like mobility and all the things I want to do. Uh, all of a sudden, I started for, for some reason seeing that the clock is ticking. So I, I started, you know, as I do, obsessive. I started going to every bloody rock concert that was going for the last two years. Greg and the wife are long for the ones that are okay, the ones that will be too heavy, she stays at home and I take the 16 year old with me, you know? The 16 year old son, he loves bands. And uh, so um, all of a sudden, I'm starting to get this, you know, like, I mean, thank God a lot of these old rock stars are, are out of money or something, you know, because they're doing all their tours down under again, you know? We've had the Eagles, the Stones, Fleetwood Mac. Deep Purple, you, know, you name it, they're coming down, down under and we're having a ball. And you know, I've been to these concerts before but I can't remember a damn thing. I mean, I remember, I remember getting all sort of, you know, getting the gear and going into the concert but most of those concerts I don't remember leaving. You know the old story, trying to find your car in the car park, which <laughs> wrong car park, you know. But, um, you know, the other thing is, uh, at the last conference, uh, on the very last day, 
Uh, one of my friends, he's here today, offered to take me out. Uh, I've got this old Indian motorcycle that I've had since I was 16 years of age. And we went out and uh, outside Los Angeles where this guy has all these old Indians. I bought the parts I needed. Uh, it's going now. Um, but I've bought four others in the meanwhile. <laughs> I bought because uh, you know, to cut a long story short, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of Indian motorcycles in Australia from the war, and uh, but I bought one just recently from Detroit, just uh, four weeks ago, five weeks ago. So I've, I've, I've joined the Indian Vintage Motorcycle Club, the Vintage Indian Club. So I mean, it's really interesting. These last two years for me, I'm going to my home group, but boy, am I giving rock concerts, motorbike riding, and all these other things a good serve because I figure that you know. Time is precious and uh, I'm about having fun. I want to have fun. I gave myself two years not to get involved too much of anything with service since World well, Service, like I'll get involved with something locally at home. But uh, I'm, I'm having a ball being clean. I tell you, what, I'm having an extra fantastic time since I've been 24 years clean. And uh, I, if, if, I could, if I could leave anything with you, I think I'm trying to get the balance right. I'm trying to get the balance right, you know. Time for family, time for meetings, time for service, time for the motorbikes, time for the rock concerts, and maybe some time for work, you know, which is interesting. I'm the workaholic, right? <laughs> so, um, anyway, I'm, I'm uh, but you know what, bottom line, we, we say, we, it's a bit of a throwaway line sometimes, but you know, everything, everything I have, I mean, you know, I met my wife at a World Service Conference, I mean, er, er, everything I have has always been as a result of coming along to narcotics and narcotics anonymous meetings and service meetings and uh, trying to give away freely what was given to me. Thanks very much. So if if you're in Australia uh, on a holiday, uh, stop by and see Garth. I did. <laughs> there are some questions we'd like to pose to the panel, and we'd like to have a response as to some things that may have happened in their life in terms of this journey called recovery. Uh, you can answer out of turn, in turn, or interrupt each other, or do whatever you want to. But, uh, I think that he'll be mic'd up so you won't have to get up. It might be a little easier that way. The first question is, uh, what's most challenging in maintaining your commitment to NA after all of these years? Uh, and your response. You tell me. My name is Danny. I'm an addict. I don't really see a challenge in anymore. I'm just excited about going to meetings. You know, when I got clean and people had relapsed and they'd come back, by the grace of God, um, I would talk with them. I'd ask them, you know, you know, what were you doing? And two things imperatively they told me they stopped doing. They stopped praying and they stopped going to meetings. And two things I have not stopped doing. I have not stopped praying and I have not stopped going to meetings. And I, I just... You know, I just think that's the key, you know, that little cliche, you know, meeting makers make it. And um, I believe that. No matter what's happened in my life, and I've had some, some major tragedies, you know, guys that I've sponsored, I fall in love with, that have passed away, and family members, and issues that, living issues that challenge you over the years when you don't think you're going to get out clean. And, um... This fellowship saved my life many times throughout the last 29 years. Because for some reason, when things were in challenge or in conflict, there was always somebody there. And I believe that's because of the foundation I, I put forth when I first got clean. Meetings every day. Um, I don't think it's cha- well, I, I don't see it as a challenge. I, I, I think it's, I love going to meetings. I love seeing new, new people come in these rooms and grow. You know, the guys I sponsor, it's just so exciting to, to watch people change and evolve and become productive members of our society. You know, I sponsor guys that are now doctors and lawyers and 
I got a guy that I sponsored who's a professor in a university in Texas, and it just, well, what a blessing in this fellowship. One of my sponsees is giving me the, the cutoff sign out here, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> All right, this on? Yeah. I think, I think uh, when I first saw this question, the first thing I thought of was, don't think about it. Because um, when I think about all, all the times that I've been involved with uh, service, because service is my entry to, to keep me going somewhere at a, at a particular time and place, and I found that my enthusiasm for NA was backfilling by then we all go out to a meeting after the service meeting, or if we was involved overseas with service work, uh, going out to meetings. I mean, seeing, seeing um, I say, usually say yes to a commitment, then think about it later because I know that if I think about not taking a commitment involved with something of NA, I'll start thinking, oh, well, I'm working the back these weeks, so I've, I've got to put some time in here, I've got to do this. And I find that um, if I think about it too much, I start looking for reasons not to make some kind of commitment. But um, the thing that actually, uh, I, I, like you, I, I don't see as a challenge. I, I see all the other things in my life uh, trying to keep the balance, you know, trying keeping the balance with family, you know, work. But also at the bottom line, I was always told something by one of my very first sponsors and it always rings in my ear, anything you put in front of your recovery you will lose. So... I say to my wife, yeah, sure, I might have to do the washing up, but I've got to get to a meeting. <laughs> my name is Jim, I'm an addict. Um, I uh, kind of feel a little bit like Garth. I, I, at about 45 days clean, I made a commitment to Narcotics Anonymous and um, I don't, I really hadn't had anything that really uh, shook that or I mean a lot of things have happened in my recovery with uh, deaths in my family uh, divorces things like that but I've, it's, it's it, it, it never shook my commitment because I, I kind of believe that you make a commitment in this program and that's it man. It's one of those ones that I don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever questioned why I'm here um and uh, I like it that way. I you know it's kind of just the way I approach it. I just don't, don't feel that I've really had anything that would challenge my commitment to recovery. Thank you. My name is Tony Amnati. And I've had a lot of um, challenges. And uh, it just made me stronger. And the one thing that we're dealing with in my area in my home group, primarily, is women, getting more women in to recovery. And uh, because I end up being the only woman in my area that has clean time that can, be spo can, that can sponsor people. And, uh, I, you know, I can't do it all. And, you know, I've always been the kind of person that w would step up to the plate when no one else would do it. That's been my role in Narcotics Anonymous. Never been the first because that there was other people wanting it. And so I had challenges like whenever I uh, became, uh, there became people that could do it, I had to step down and let them do it. And then I learned that each one of these little challenges, because it threatened me, I'll be, everything threatened me. Uh, I was very immature, you know. I didn't know how to, to respond appropriately to, to, to growth. And so in these experiences, I learned how to allow people to, to you know, not to try to, to run everything, which I'm a runner of the show, you know. Oh, I just run things. So bad. But, so I have to learn, I have to discipline myself. And it's such a challenge for me to, uh, to, to get other people involved instead of me trying to do it all. And when I went to Brian... Uh, I had to do it again. Like in the beginning, when we first started in A in Houston, uh, I had to 
you know, I, I got to do it, but I knew better by my experiences. I stepped down as soon as there was someone that could do it. And I kept getting the new people involved, uh, or my role in that group, you know, I just, and then everybody else does that now, you know, and, uh, and so, it's so rewarding because the new, you know, it just, I never had a place to, to belong, and I never had a purpose until I came to Narcotics Anonymous. And my purpose is to, to share this message of recovery. And, uh, and you know, that they said something to me before uh, our meeting started, and, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about doing uh, anything, you know, important or thing. All I have to do is share my experience here. That's all I have. And my experience is that if you don't let the new person in, and the women, the women, we are so few to stay. It takes us so much longer to get it. And I just want to tell you that, you know, keep coming back no matter what. You can do this thing. We need you. We don't express that enough, that we need you. We need you here. Thank you. Due to the time constraints, we are having difficulty, not we have difficulties, you say we have to congregate somewhere else, and that's the only kind of thing. But we have a lot of outside congregations, you see the people that are here, uh, many of you have some of your sharing that you would like probably to do, uh, you're going to have to do it another time because we do have a schedule we have to keep. Uh, at this time, I'd like to bring Jerry D. from Brooklyn, New York to read, We Do Recover. Named Jerry D. We do recover, and at the end of the road, we find that we can no longer function as human beings, either with or without drugs. We all face the same dilemma. What is there left to do? There seems to be this alternative: either going as best we can to the bitter ends, jails, institutions of death, or find a new way to live. In years gone by, very few addicts ever had this last chance. Those who are addicted today are more fortunate. For the first time in man's entire history, a simple way has been proven itself in the lives of many addicts. It's available to us all. This is a simple, spiritual, not religious program known as Narcotics Anonymous. I don't know if they said in Texas, they said, we're going to have to round it up, <laughs> make the circle. <laughs> and we say the prayer on out of here. Or a prayer in here, if one of the two. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please help us improve our ranking so others can find us by putting a review on Stitcher, iTunes, or your favorite podcast index. Napot is ad-free thanks to the folks supporting the show with a dollar or more per month. If you enjoy listening, you can join them by going to notpot.xyz and looking for the donate link. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.